How's everybody doing? Good, good. Um, thank you if you participated in the 10 minutes of prayer in between the services. If you weren't able to do that, on your way out, there's uh, little cards in the foyer. Just grab one and, and uh, be in prayer for uh, Ukraine and Pastor Sergey and his family and the church there in Babrista. We are in uh, beginning stages of our Intimate Living series. We've just covered some introductory material for the first four weeks. I gave you a definition of what um, intimacy is, and it, it turned out it was a scriptural definition, and it will, that'll just be reinforced more and more as we go through this particular series. In week two, we talked about the various, we disseminated the various avenues um, of intimacy, and we said that we're going to cover five of those areas. And as well as week three and week four, um, we talked about the biblical pathway of God's invitation, of him writing the check, what did that look like, as well as um, our acceptance, the biblical way of accepting and of endorsing that check. Now it's time to pivot. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to pivot and start considering those defining areas. And we're going to look at individual character traits, skills, that are going to reinforce and reward our intimacy efforts. And we're going to start with emotional intimacy. That's where we're starting. And we're going to be in that emotional intimacy area for several, several sermons. Emotional intimacy, and I had shared this with you back in week two, Emotional intimacy is the harmonization of innermost thoughts, of vulnerabilities, of feelings, of impressions, and that can be conscious or subconscious. And we're going to offer through this series, now we're going to be offering a stark contrast between attributes that facilitate emotional intimacy, our building blocks, so to speak, and those that impede Intimacy, and those are the roadblocks. If you might recall in uh, our introduction material, I said for every roadblock there is a building block. And so we're going to look at those in this particular series. And similar to habits, each of these qualities, whether they are the good quality, the building block, or the bad quality, the roadblock, each of those could be developed and maintained. So obviously the implementation of the positive traits, the building blocks, are going to minimize the leverage and the power that the negative trait that the roadblock has in our lives. And strengthening these positive character traits in our lives, it's going to be equivalent to cutting one link in the chain that holds us back from experiencing intimacy. But this chain is different. Because when you cut one link of this chain to try to become intimate with God and intimate with others, the chain fuses together. So all those links, we need to cut all those links, and that's what we're going to do throughout this series this year. We're going to cut those links. As we increase these particular attributes, we're going to, one by one, we're going to grow stronger and deeper and more personal in our relationships with God and with others. And increasing this intimacy, it's going to require doing an honest inventory of ourselves about these individual qualities, whether or not we display these character traits now or whether we need to develop that particular character trait. We should consider each of these character issues as essential if we're wanting to remove the constricting and the constraints of these particular shackles. So let's, let's go. So I am not easily distracted unless I'm distracted. I can be laser focused. You can even ask Susie. I mean, she has seen it for years. We've been married 32 years. She's seen it over and over and over again. I can become so laser focused. I, I'm intense. I can become like the pit bull that's holding on the stick, and there's no way you're going to pry it out of my mouth. One such moment came in 2009. I was taking a ministry break, and I decided that I was going to take on a personal spiritual project. And I decided on this extreme adventure that I'd always wanted to do, I wanted to harmonize the four gospel accounts into one chronological record. So what I wanted to do was take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and fuse them together. I used the NIV version to do that. 
fuse them together in one chronological account. And if someone were to ask me, of all the things that you've done in ministry work-wise, what is the task that stands apart than all of them? It is this. It is called Experience True Harmony. And there are copies in the atrium. I thought we had more copies available than we do, so I've ordered 20 more. We don't carry as many of those here. They're free. Um, but they are more expensive. If you don't want to wait on yours, you can get yours from Amazon, but I'm cheap, so I'd wait for the free ones to show up in the atrium and just pick one up. But during this time, awake or asleep, this project just consumed me. It captivated me. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to fuse these gospel accounts together without sacrificing text, without sacrificing context, and it became all-consuming. The hours just glazed by, and, and sometimes late into the evening, I was reading, I was blending, I was referencing, I was triple-checking every verse, every phrase, every single individual word. And days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into six months of work. Fourteen-hour days were common, minutely, meticulously checking the text, the scriptures, and formatting a newly constructed text. And shortly after the completion of the work, I started developing daily headaches. And the intense, comprehensive labor had strained my eyes. And so many Advil later in a trip to the optometrist revealed my need for glasses. And my ability to focus without assistance, at least up close anyway, was gone. But whenever I flip through that book, I'm just awestruck. I am just completely grateful that God used me to do, to do something so just wild. Now, by no means am I claiming inspiration. I just simply harmonized what was already Holy Spirit inspired by the gospel authors. However, it did and it has afforded a unique perspective to me about the original biblically inspired authors. They must have quaked at the fulfillment of their letters and their books. After it was all over with, they must have looked back and just said, what just happened? God just, I can't believe God just did that, but he did, because I'm, I'm looking at the letter, I'm looking at the books. And it leaves me speechless sometimes, and humbled by the totality of it. And experience true harmony, that's, that is a reminder to me of how intensely focused I can become. But at times in my life, my life choices have revealed the flip side of that coin as well. I, I've often been distracted. I've often, I've started lots of books. I've started more books than I've actually finished. You know, but I usually get through the introduction and something else comes up and I don't finish. I've been in the middle of painting rooms in the house. Got, got the tarp out and the paint and the paint brushes. And then I remember, you know, my football team or, or some other favorite team of mine is playing on TV and in go the paintbrushes and the rollers into the bags and they tied off so, so that they can just wait till later. And there's been times in the early years when we didn't have much money, there were times I let the oil go way beyond the recommended, recommended mileage for the car and I just got accustomed to seeing the change oil light. It didn't bother me anymore. It was like it was a part of the way it was supposed to be. My distraction stories are numerous. Focused or distracted? I've spent time in both arenas. How about you? Do you live your life focused, more so, or distracted? When you recommitted to your marriage, did you get sidetracked and let it slip away? Have you ever decided that at one particular point with your job, you decided to intensely focus on your job to gain that promotion? But as the promotion got delayed... Your old habits of coming in late, leaving early, and taking a really, really long lunch got in the way, and the promotion was given to someone else. When you decided to commit to homeschooling, did you finish the first year? Or after the first semester, you were like, oh my goodness, I'd, I had no earthly idea that it was going to be like that. It is way too much work, and you put them back in public school. Or how about your dog? <laughs> Remember when you promised your parents... I will take care of the dog. I will feed the dog. I'll even pay for the first years of vet bills. You won't have to ask me. I will do everything. That lasted like three days. How about the professionals 
that provides services to you? Do you want your surgeon who is performing open heart surgery focused or distracted? Do you want your attorney focused on your case or the other five that they just got in? Do you want your realtor focused on selling your home or the other 10 that they just listed? Do you want your plumber focused on the leak underneath the sink or distracted by the political conversation that you want to have? Do you want your broker focused or distracted when he's selling your stock? How about the dentist? When he's drilling your tooth, you want him focused on that or you want him distracted about his vacation that's coming up? Do you want God's undivided attention or are you, you know, satisfied with the leftovers? Focused or distracted? I'm sure we all can agree that attentiveness, and that's what we're talking about today, that's the building block. Attentiveness. Attentiveness has tremendous blessings. If you desire true emotional intimacy with God, if you desire true emotional intimacy with another human being, developing the trait of attentiveness is going to enhance and expedite that pursuit. And there's two very interesting verses in Scripture that we're going to use today to talk about this. John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. We're going to discover three focal points that were worthy of Jesus' attention and focus and three distractions that he refused. Here's that verse. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. <laughs> One free lunch. That's all it took. One free lunch fueled the people's enthusiastic desire to force worldly kingship on Jesus. And even after they all had their fill, 12 baskets of leftovers were collected. 5,000 men. 5,000 men. That's not even counting women and children. So what are we talking about here? About the original five loaves and two fish fed what? 10,000 people? 12,000? 15,000 people from five loaves and two fish? That's quite impressive. I'm just saying, I've been to a lot of lunches. I've been to a lot of dinners. That one is pretty impressive. And it's hard to envision life getting any better than having a king who's going to feed you every day. I mean, what could be more miraculous? Well, maybe what was more miraculous was what Jesus did as a response to the people's zeal and euphoria. You know what he did? He withdrew. He hid himself. Why? To stay attentive and focused on his mission. Let's talk about these three things. First, Jesus focused on the Father. He refused to be distracted by the crowd. He focused on the Father, refused to be distracted by the crowd. Time spent with the Father is not time spent alone. Jesus was fully cognizant of this. And so when John tells us that Jesus withdrew by himself, what he means is no one else was there. No one except Big Daddy, his Father. And that's why Jesus withdrew, to share another intimate moment with his Father. It was common for Jesus to go into solitary places. Jesus withdrew before a major task retiring after his baptism to the wilderness for 40 days before he began his public ministry. Jesus hid himself to work through grief after the beheading of his cousin and his forerunner, John the Baptist. Jesus removed himself from the crowds to recharge his spiritual batteries after long days of ministry. Jesus, he was led away, slipped away before making important decisions like the night before he chose the 12 disciples. Jesus withdrew in times of distress, walking back to the garden before he was arrested. Time and time and time again, Jesus demonstrates finding solitary, lonely places for the purpose of praying. He was communing. He was living in fellowship, intimate fellowship with his Father. It was the source of his strength. It was the source of his power. It was the source of his comfort. It also helped them stay focused on his Father's will, not the crowd's wishes, certainly not the disciples' desire, and not even his mama or his brother's hopes. Jesus focused on his Father and refused to be distracted by the crowd. Sounds like pretty good advice for us, too. Second, Jesus focused on the best. He refused to be distracted by the good. 
You know, Jesus encountered a very disturbing foe in the first century. And you might say, well, you know, Tim's getting ready to talk about the Roman Empire. Nope. Maybe he's going to talk about the Pharisees. Nope. The disturbing foe that he faced was the Jewish mindset for the Messiah. Most of Israel's hopes, most of their desires for the Messiah were earthly and fleshly and carnal. I mean, their expectation was for a fleshly kingdom and a fleshly king to right all the wrongs of Roman occupation, of Roman dominance, of Roman influence over their lives. I mean, most Jews expected that the Messiah was going to restore the glory days of King David. And for millennia, they misconstrued the signs and the wonders. For centuries, they misinterpreted the law and the prophets. And for three and a half years, years, they misunderstood Jesus. The spiritual kingdom that Jesus was establishing was nowhere on their radar. And yet this heavenly kingdom never left his heart. It never left his mind. It never left his spirit. It's why he came. It's why he lived. It's why he died. It's why he was raised to life. And he was fully aware of the physical pain that was involved to bring about the spiritual gain. It would not require a royal's crown. It was going to take a rugged cross. The purchase was made through humiliation, not exaltation. It was a commitment of self-sacrifice, not of self-determined selfishness. The kingship that he came to set up was beyond Jewish presuppositions and was beyond their perception. It was the best kingdom, not just a good kingdom. Yes, a good kingdom could provide a place where people could come and be fed daily. Yes, a great kingdom would make life easier. Food would always be on the table. I mean, work would be unnecessary. And who would have to pray to God for daily bread? But Jesus wasn't satisfied with just good. And so he ushered in the best the kingdom of God, the church, and not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. And not even the, man, we miss Stephen Scran. He'd be like, preach it, brother, amen. And not even the gates of hell can prevail against the church. Man, the only kingdom for which Jesus would consider being king was the one his father had sent him to earth as the incarnate word to establish. And this he focused on. He would not get sidetracked by second best. Third, Jesus focused on the eternal. He refused to be distracted by the moment. He focused on the eternal and refused to be distracted by the moment. When Jesus got away, he thought about eternity. Our eternity. If he had given in to the whims and the wishes of the crowd, if he had gone after the good at the expense of the best, we would still be dead in our sins with no eternal hope. But Jesus had to die for our pardon. He had to fully fulfill the requirements of being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He had to offer himself as the final true Passover Lamb that allows the death angel, so to speak, to pass over his children without passing judgment. And at this particular moment in Jesus' life, the crowd wanting Jesus to be their king. It was indeed a powerful moment. It was a consequential point in time, but there was a colossal complication, and that is they wanted a king, but Jesus knew they needed the king. And their loyalties were loose, and their allegiance was tied to the flow of fish and bread, the daily provisions, and Jesus discerned their motives. And what was in Jesus' mind was provision far beyond just physical needs. He had the power to meet their every need, and he has the power to meet your every need too. Amen? Man, that cinnamon roll was really good this morning. I'm just telling you, whew, getting worked up. In order to bring this kingdom, his kingdom into existence, he had to refuse the temporary attentions and the with withering shouts of praise from the people. It would demand an unwavering view of eternity, a commitment surpassing any particular single moment in time. Jesus grasped the seriousness and the significance of this particular moment, eternity and forgiveness of sins from the very first person to the very last person was at stake right at this very moment. And Jesus stayed focused on the eternal and avoided the temptation found in this fleeting moment. 
He demonstrated his resolve. He demonstrated his intimacy with his father. And he leaned into that relationship and pressed forward towards your salvation and my salvation. Praise God he passed that test. Because if he hadn't, we'd have no reason to be here today. Each of these three focal points, each of these three distractions are worthy for our consideration. You see, the Father's will should be what we're living for, what we're striving for. His will and his way, it's got to be the foundation for our lives as it was for Jesus. Let me tell you, the crowd seldom, if ever, has your best interest in mind. Parents, I know you've told your kids this. You've had to have told you, listen, don't just go, you know, willy-nilly into whatever the crowd, your peers are telling you to do. The crowd very seldom ever has your best interest in mind. But I'm here to tell you that God, our Father, every single time, always, 100% of the time, never one exception, has our best interest in mind when he tells us something. When he says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers, there's a reason. When he says, wait until marriage for your sexual intimacy with your married partner, your spouse, there's a reason. When he says, don't get drunk, when he says, you know, refuse the immoral lifestyle, there are reasons why he says this for our benefit. He has our best interests in mind. And often we have to silence the crowd. The crowd is so loud. Have you noticed? It's so loud. We have to silence the crowd to be able to hear the Father. Our lives can be often made more difficult because we choose the good at the expense, at the neglect of the best. If a choice is afforded to us, we should always choose the best. I know. It takes more time to achieve. I know that. I know that also that it takes more resources to obtain. I understand that. But seldom, if ever, does best disappoint Jesus and his kingdom are the best. And the rest are counterfeits. The rest are wannabes. When it comes to perspective, the eternal is always supreme and offers steadfast guidance. We've got to live our lives with heaven clearly in our sights. The moment we currently find ourselves in, it's going to soon fade. But eternity remains forever. And the decisions that we make today in that particular moment will often impact and affect our lives much longer than the moment itself lasts. So we have to choose wisely from a godly perspective because the Bible tells us as Christians, our citizenship is not here. It is in heaven. And so we have to choose wisely. So how do we do this? How, how do we implement this sermon? How do we take this faith step? What does it look like? How do we bridge the distance between where we are today and where we want to be intimately walking with God? Well, I'm going to give you a gap goal. That book's out there too. You can grab one of those while you're, while you're looking and waiting for the Experience True Harmony books to come in. Here's a gap goal. For the next seven days, for one week, I just want to... I want to encourage you to take 15 minutes. Just take 15 minutes and be alone with God. 15 minutes. Seven times. Close your office door. Get to work before everybody else does. Go to lunch by yourself. Take a walk. If you're a night owl, stay up just a little bit later. If you're an early bird, you know, get up before everybody else. Find someplace calming, like nature, the back porch, your favorite chair. For 15 minutes, get away from everything and everybody. Don't rush things. It's going to take some time to get all those concerns, all those thoughts out of your brain. Let it go. Leave technology behind. Do not bring your cell phone. It is a solitude killer. And when you've secured your location and you've created your environment of solitude, dedicate time to read, to journal, to worship, to pray, and to listen to God. Let him speak to you. Let him answer your question. You say, Tim, what question do I have? What is your will for my life? What is your will for my life? He'll answer the question. If you want to foster intimacy with another human being, just do the same thing. This week, spend 15 minutes, seven days in a row, with the person that you want to build intimacy with. It may look different. You may have to Zoom or make a phone call or maybe email or go to lunch or go for a walk. There's, there's so many ways that you can demonstrate attentiveness, but remove all the distractions and truly be present. You see, the key to Jesus' attentiveness was that he purposely withdrew so that he could spend time in the presence of the Father. And solitude, it has so many benefits. Yes, it can cultivate creativity. Yes, it can amplify our understanding. Yes, it can spark 
restoration. Yes, it, there's increased productivity when we're alone. But more importantly than all that, it can facilitate intimacy with God and with others. How our lives would change if we were attentive to the Father, attentive to the best, and attentive to the eternal. How our lives would change if we would just refuse to get sucked into the distractions of the crowd, the good, and the temporary moments that seem so vital at that particular moment, but they just turn into vapors in our hyper-connected culture and society. We need these solitary environments to declutter our mind, to declutter our heart. Solitude and silence are spiritual disciplines that will assist us in being more attentive to the Lord and Savior of our lives. When we're attentive to God, we're going to be able to discover the attitudes and actions that have to be harmonized to his will. That's the first part of our intimacy definition. When we're attentive to him, we're going to see him. We're going to know him. We're going to connect with him at significant personal depth. That's the second part of our intimacy definition. And when we're attentive to him, we're going to experience oneness with our God. That's the third part of our definition of intimacy. You see, attentiveness, it's a building block for intimacy. Let's continue to worship this morning.
drift into the night Wanting a place to hide This weary soul This bag of bones I try with all my mind But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A bag of bones Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. He told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my face. What I see, no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friend, but in bitterness, you can just keep it moving. Yeah, you're welcome here. From now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This way we're turned, it's found his way back home. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on the solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart. Love you so much. We will see you very soon. Be blessed.